Welcome back uh, to the second weekend of the Greater Cambridge Sitting Assembly. Fantastic to have you all back uh, with us today. So, very quick kind of recap of, um, of why we're here. Um, so, as you know, the Citizen Assembly has been called by the Greater Cambridge Partnership. Uh, we're looking at this question of how we reduce uh, congestion, improve air quality and provide better public transport in Greater Cambridge. Uh, the Citizen Assembly itself is part of a, a wider a government uh, funded program called the Innovation in Democracy uh, program, which is testing out this kind of citizen assembly methodology in three uh, different uh, areas of the country. And so the role uh, that you're playing as the citizen assembly, um, as we kind of explored in the first weekend, is really to kind of hear all of that kind of rich evidence, hear the different kind of uh, experiences of transport in, uh, in Cambridge and the Greater Cambridge area. And this weekend is where all of that kind of hard work from the first weekend and a lot of hard work actually, I should say, uh, for the second weekend as well, really comes, uh, 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 comes into its own because uh, by the end of this weekend, you'll be making recommendations around what you think um, should happen uh, in Greater Cambridge. So we'll be talking through this in a bit more detail uh, throughout the weekend, but a very quick recap of what's going to happen then to the recommendations that you make. Uh, so the recommendations will be uh, put to the, the board of, um, of GCP, of the Greater Cambridge Partnership, and will be uh, considered as part of their then decision-making process around uh, um, uh, what, uh, what needs to be done to, uh, to tackle uh, the issues that the Assembly uh, is focusing on. Uh, there'll be an opportunity for, um, for some of you actually to, to present your recommendations at a, um, at a meeting of the, the GCP board. So towards the end of the weekend, we'll be uh, collecting uh, hopefully uh, kind of a list of volunteers who'd like to, if you'd like to put yourself forward uh, for that. And then GCP will then be responding to the, the recommendations that you make um, as well. So, I just realised I didn't introduce myself, I should have done that to begin with, but uh, hopefully you remember who I am. I'm Tim, uh, so I'll be one of your lead facilitators for the weekend, along with uh, uh, Susanna. Uh, so, it's our role, as with the first weekend, to make sure everything's kind of running on time, making sure everybody knows what they're doing, uh, making sure that we are meeting kind of the aims and objectives of the Assistant Assembly that, um, that Suze will uh, recap in a little bit um, as well. Uh, then you have your wonderful team of table facilitators uh, as well. So we have Mel, we have Diane, we have Kevin, Clive, Steve, Lizzie, and a new table facilitator this weekend, Liz, uh, at the back there. Uh, so you'll have an opportunity in a little bit to introduce yourselves to each other on, on your table. So I'm sure you've probably already started that already, but there'll be a little bit of time to, uh, to do a bit more of that uh, in a minute. Uh, we're also kind of spoiling you again this weekend with uh, a fantastic array of experts to, to draw on. Uh, so we've got a few kind of familiar faces in uh, David and Peter and Lynn who were with us for the first weekend. But you'll notice we've got uh, some, uh, some new experts as well who will be here uh, particularly today to, to help with uh, some of the presentations around the, uh, uh, the different measures that we're going to be considering. Uh, so you'll hear from uh, Gillian, Steve and Richard and we'll give them a, a fuller introduction a little bit later, but just to, so you know that uh, they're in the room. So uh, we also have the, uh, the fantastic support team um, as well, many of whom you will have kind of met on the way in, so kind of Andreas, um, we've got somebody new, Theo, uh, uh, today, and uh, well, various other people in the green t-shirt. So if you have any um, questions during the, the weekend, anything, that's, uh, anything to do with food, anything to do with expenses, uh, things like that, then uh, do kind of find one of the people in the green t-shirts and they'll be helped, able to help or come to, to one of us um, as well. And of course, uh, the most important people in the room are you, uh, the Citizen Assembly members, um, and it will be your hard work that, uh, uh, that really kind of makes a difference with the, uh, the recommendations at the end of the weekend. Um, 
we also have uh, an array of kind of observers at the back of the room uh, again uh, this um, this weekend. There are kind of a mixture of people from uh, some uh, kind of voluntary and community sector organisations, um, some from uh, national government, some like evaluators and uh, uh, local media. Same rules from uh, last weekend apply again today. So we're asking them not to kind of talk to you uh, in in the breaks. Um, and they will be kind of at the back, so they won't be listening in on your table discussions. But they will get to see what kind of what's happening as part of the system assembly. A little bit of housekeeping just to go through quickly. So toilets haven't moved; they're in the same place as they were before. So hopefully you know where those are. Um, uh, fire alarm if that happens. Uh, same uh, same uh, thing again. So. We'll, we'll lead you out, but the uh, congregation point will be outside um, in the car park. But um, yeah, if, uh, if fire alarm goes off, then we will give you instructions. Um, so we, we do have some filming happening this weekend. So we've got the live stream that will be on at various different points of the assembly, particularly during the presentations and introductions. But it won't be capturing what you're saying on your, on your tables. Uh, we'll also have Elliot, who was with us last weekend, who's the filmmaker. Uh, he'll be here tomorrow, so he'll be uh, doing some more filming of kind of what's happening in the room and asking probably for a few more Vox Pops as well, if anybody is uh, willing to do a kind of quick segment to, to camera. Uh, so he will be in uh, tomorrow. Uh, s forms, I'm sure you're kind of sick of these, but um, we do want to make sure that we're getting back all of your expenses forms and, and things like that, uh, so we can make sure that you're um, reimbursed. So if you've not completed any forms or given in any receipts, then please do find Andreas and um, uh, we can get that uh, sorted uh, as quickly as possible after the assembly. Uh, so there were some kind of press and social media guidelines. Um, uh, the key one being that feel free to share your experience of being part of the system assembly, but not to share the content. But actually, uh, tomorrow when the votes get announced, that's the point at which that kind of embargo gets lifted. So from that point onwards, you'll then be able to, to talk about the content. You'll be able to talk about what you've come up with as a system assembly. We'll say a bit more about this tomorrow. Uh, but between now and then, please kind of stick to that. Kind of feel free to. To, to share your experience of the assembly, but until we uh, kind of, I guess, officially announce the results uh, tomorrow, uh, don't talk about the content. Um, in your packs, you'll have your uh, so from um, well, your table facilitators will uh, have your postcards um, if you wrote one uh, from the first weekend. So that's your kind of reminder of some things that you thought were um, important from uh, from the first weekend. So uh, just have a look at those um, when you get a get a chance. So quick run through the conversation guidelines that we came up with in the, the first weekend. And they're up around the room, so you'll be able to refer to those as we go um, as well. Uh, quick kind of uh, canter through them. So there was a step forward, step back. So that was to kind of challenge yourself if you're maybe a little bit shy to kind of put forward uh, your point perhaps more than you uh, typically would. On the other hand, if you tend to uh, be quite confident in these uh, situations, then also challenge yourself to take a bit of a step back and listen to, to what others are saying. Uh, no question is a bad question. This applies throughout the system assembly. There'll be, there's lots of content that will be going through. You've probably already seen um, the handbook that we've, uh, we've handed out, with, which has lots of measures in. Do not be uh, kind of scared of the amount of content in that. We'll be going through it in detail, in kind of step by step throughout the, the weekend. There'll be lots of opportunity to ask the experts questions around that. And do not be afraid to, to ask those, um, those questions. So uh, we will kind of deal with those um, as we go. Um, phones away and on silence, please. Um, respect each other's privacy, so don't share kind of photos of people unless they've um, agreed that you can share them um, and things like that. Uh, this one, uh, well, talk about your experience, not the outcomes. We've covered that. Respect everyone's opinions and background. Keep an open mind. Uh, keep on topic. Keep it local, not political. Actively listen. Avoid repetition. No interrupting, signal you want to contribute, try to not get into a heated argument, speak to the table, don't rush, give people time, think about your body language, uh, be open to challenge, um, start fresh and be open-minded, and be kind and helpful to each other. 
And we've ha actually had uh, an additional one suggested from what are we, table five that uh, for, for today in particular, no spoilers about the rugby. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> are, we, are we happy to add that as kind of the, an additional one? <laughs> Should we take a quick vote on that? So people who don't want any spoilers about the rugby, stick your hand up. <laughs> so it's smattering. People who actually would quite like to know what the score is. Okay, probably about an equal number. And people who just don't care. Like <laughs> okay, well, I think apathy wins in that case. So... <laughs> So uh, I think that's enough of me. So over to Suze now. Okay, so a reminder, and it's up a, a, around the, the, the walls, the assembly question, how do we reduce congestion, improve air quality, and provide better public transport in Greater Cambridge? Um, just wanted to really quickly cast our mind back to the first weekend and remember what we did then. So um, you heard quite a lot about Greater Cambridge, about the situation, about the kind of growth context as well, um, and what plans are currently underway in terms of uh, what GCP is planning, and Peter will give a really quick recap of that in a minute. Then we spent quite a bit of time, if you remember, reflecting on the impacts of congestion and air quality and public transport, drawing on your own experiences, and... Um, trying to remember that we also heard from uh, Joe Dix and Liz Robbins um, about the uh, health and air quality impacts, and we heard from Justin Bishop about the environment and climate impacts, and Dan Thorpe from Cambridge Ahead about the impacts on work and business, and then um, David also talked about the wider impacts on, on our lives. And if you remember, we also kind of, you came up with that list of impacts that you wanted to avoid. Um, we'll, we'll, we'll come back to that in a minute. And then we also started to think on the Sunday about visions, about what things might look like and, and, and be different. And if you recall, we had um, a number of local speakers. Um, uh, giving their kind of perspective on future visions. So we heard from Anne Miller from Carbon Neutral Cambridge, Edward Lee from Smarter Cambridge Transport, James Littlewood from Cambridge Past, Present and Future, Alex Plant from Anglian Water, John Grant from the Fenline Users Association, and Roxanne Debeau from CamCycle. Um, and then you remember we started to think about, well, what were your, what's your ideas of visions for, for the future? Um, we heard a bit more from Peter about the plans from GCP, and then we heard from Rachel Aldridge from the University of Westminster about thinking about some of the wider experiences in other locations and, and, and what they've done. Um, and then you generated those ideas about vision outcomes, and then towards the end of, of um, Sunday took a vote on those. Those are all in your packs, by the way. So the impacts and the visions and the vote um, are in your pack. And we'll keep on kind of coming back and reminding about those as a, as, as a reference point for you throughout the weekend. Um, and then we finished up last Sunday thinking about, OK, so if that's where we want to get to, how might we get there? And that's going to be really the focus of um, this next weekend. So I, I will come back to this in a minute, but really quickly, and you have that in your pack, that those were the results from the vision outcomes work. So today, what we're going to do is we're going to do a little bit of recap, not loads, and some clarifications from weekend one, mainly responding to the points that you said and raised through, your, through the bike rack, through the burning questions that you, that you came through. And then we're going to be hearing today a lot about the different measures um, to reduce congestion and improve air quality and provide better public transport. So you will be seeped in all of the different kind of tools in the toolbox and the different kind of ingredients that might help us to take, um, to move towards that vision. And there will be a lot of time at tables for you to discuss and probe and think about, well, what's good about these measures? What's bad about these measures? What sort of considerations might you um, uh, be thinking about if they were taking forward? Um, and as before, hopefully, you'll also have a good, have a good time. Uh, so we, really quickly, in terms of the agenda, um, we'll, we'll shortly go into some clarifications. Um, 
David will give and uh, will will give an introduction into the different into the different measures and the contact uh, context, and then we're going to take the the measures in kind of chunks. So first of all, we're going to look at measures around restricting road space, and then in the afternoon, road pricing, parking pricing, and some of the systems and supporting measures as well. And we have a great panel, which I'll introduce in a minute, to to kind of help and support us both from the front here, but absolutely actively at your tables as well, so you'll be able to, to draw on their expertise. Okay, that's enough from um, me for now. Um, so can I suggest that you go around your tables and uh, have some introductions and think about um, what you brought forward from previous, previous weeks? So I'll just give you 10 minutes or so for that. Um, so, uh, just really quickly before we hear from Peter, I just wanted to remind people or to tell people what we did um, with your outputs from weekend one. So, as I mentioned before, in your packs, you've got a piece of paper which goes through um, the impacts or lists the impacts that um, we came through, and you might want to reference that. So, remind yourself of the, the impacts that you wanted to that you had identified and you wanted to, to look to address. And then on the other side are the, the kind of, have you got a pack, have you, is it in your packs? It's, yeah, cool. Um, and then on the other side are the, the kind of vision elements that you voted on, if you remember with the, the, the Mentimeter voting. And again, for, for you to kind of reference as you go through. The other thing that you did is that do you remember we had the bike rack up and we had the solutions basket and we also asked you about your kind of burning um, questions at the end. And there were lots of also unanswered questions from the presentation, so we looked through all of that. And we looked at it to say, okay, is there anything about the program coming up that we need to change? Are there things that we need to add in? Are there clarifications that we need to, to make? Clearly, we're not going to have been able to address everything that people raised, but we looked through it for kind of key themes. Um, so, uh, this weekend is very much about kind of solutions and measures and there was quite a lot of themes around, well, what do we do and how do we get there and where does the funding come from and what about this measure, how might that work? So, you'll see that come through the uh, programme. We also looked at some of the solutions that were suggested and you'll see at the end of today, we will bring some of those back. So, some people will um, raise some solutions and there's some time at the end of the day-to-day uh, -to, -day to, to come up with other supporting measures that you think are part of the mix. Um, and there were also a kind of bunch of things which were about clarifications, a lot around what GCP's plans are. So, we're now going to hear from Peter who's going to start off some of that and, um, and, and kind of recap where GCP is at. Yeah? Uh, good morning, everybody. So I'm going to clarify stuff as, uh, as best as I can, and I'm, I'm going to hopefully hit the right button because I got it wrong last time. Uh, right, okay. So, so these were some uh, questions and issues that, that you raised during the, the, the last weekend um, in terms of what is or where is Greater Cambridge. Um, so by Greater Cambridge, we mean the Cambridge City Council and South Cambridge District Council areas because that's the agreement that local partners came up with with government. That's where we, we the, 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 the agreement we have for half a billion pounds covers that area. But if you recall all of the presentations that you had on um, in weekend one, in particular the presentation that, that Lynn gave, transport and, and movements do not respect local authority boundaries. You know, there's an awful lot of people who travel in and around Greater Cambridge from Ely, from Fenland, from Huntingdon, from Newmarket and, and the rest. And so we need to be aware of that. We need to be planning and working with colleagues in those areas to develop solutions for that. So, so that's why uh, East Cambridge is not part of the deal, but is part of the considerations and part of your considerations for the rest of the weekend. The money comes from government. 500 million pounds uh, over the course of 15 years uh, that, that is focused on, on delivering ring fenced improvements to, to our areas. Why, why the focus or our focus on, on peak time and commuter travel? Um, simply because the evidence tells us that's the focus of our problem. 
You, you can travel around Greater Cambridge um, off peak of an evening on a Saturday morning. There's a lot less travel and the, the issues are far less pronounced. So what we're trying to do is focus on the real pinch points, which primarily are, are peak time and, and commuter travel. But we need to be alive to the fact that not everybody travels you know, between 7 and, and, and 9 on a, a Monday to Friday morning. Um, and we need to be providing solutions across the board, not just at those particular times. Um, what, what's currently planned? Um, I'm just going to jump to this slide. So currently, we, we have an infrastructure program that, that is saying we want to develop uh, new public transport corridors. And some of you may well have received in the, in the post in, 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 in recent weeks um, questionnaires and consultation material about, about some of our proposals there. We're working with the mayor on, on the ambition for a metro, but that's likely to take some time, likely to be 2030 by the time it, it comes through. We've done a lot of local work on walking, cycling, uh, greenway improvements. Uh, been doing work with the, the bus company on electric bus pilots, electric charging points for, for vehicles, a review of the traffic signals across the area. So that there's already a, a, an infrastructure plan that, that's been agreed. This only delivers part of the agenda that we're looking to try and deliver. So we're trying to reduce traffic levels to achieve carbon zero and to promote public transport, walking and cycling. And the infrastructure program only gets us part of the way there. So that's not the primary focus of your considerations. Your considerations are what else do we need to do? So how do we make buses faster, more regular, more reliable, particularly in the tight urban environment that we've got, knowing that congestion already exists and air quality already exists <laughs> and all the information that you went through in, um, in, in the previous weekend, how do we make it more affordable? How do we invest more in walking and cycling? And it's easy to say, yes, we'll throw money at the problem. But as, as you considered last time, actually, a lot of the issues within, within Cambridge itself is space. Because if there's an awful lot of traffic there, you can have less facilities for pedestrians or less facilities for, for cyclists. So how do we provide cleaner vehicles? How do we provide more travel opportunities from those areas outside of the city, from the Ely, the Huntingdons, the new markets of the world that encourage people to use other, other, forms, of, uh, other forms of public and, and sustainable transport? And I think what we were trying to, 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 to sort of tease out of you is how do we change the balance you know, at the moment, we have very car-dominated environments on part of our area and part of our network. And that, that's led to congestion, it's led to air quality, it's led to concerns from some of our communities that, that actually, you know, for large periods of time, there's just a traffic jam on their, on their local roads. And what do we need to do, or what do you think we need to do to change that? Um, so how do we manage the competing road space? If there's too many cars, you can't put more cyclists on. Uh, you can't have more pedestrian crossings. How do we provide more and cleaner um, public, public vehicles, and where does the money come from to do that? Um, what do we mean by restrictions? Are we up for restrictions for private vehicles, HGV vehicles, all vehicles, for some of the day, for all of the day? Are we up for charging vehicles to come in? that would be then ring-fenced and spent on public transport alternatives. Is that something that, that, that people are willing to accept? Um, and if so, can that be managed in a better way? So can we deal with issues of equity and fairness and make sure alternatives exist? Um, and so how much are you, if you were the decision makers, prepared to make changes that would deliver some of the improvements on congestion and air quality that you considered in weekend one? Thank you. Great, thank you. Any kind of really immediate questions on Peter? I'm a bit reluctant to open up to 60 people questions because that could take us the rest of the day. But any like really pressing clarifications from that? Oh, let's crack on. So, um, I promise you're soon going to get, get down into your tables. There's quite a lot of uh, talk to get this, get this going. Um, so, Peter there talked about 
um, you know, what's planning and what are possibilities. And the, your, the beginning of your pack, I think it talks about improvements that are there and some of which we, we talked about in the, in the first weekend. Um, I said I was going to keep on coming back to this. So these were, these were the impacts that you remember you wanted to avoid, the, the time wasted by people being struck, stuck in traffic. Um, I'm not going to go through them all. The health impacts of, of poor air quality. So thinking, I, I, I think some of the, 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 the air quality speakers talked in the first weekend that, you know, that there are bigger costs. So if you're, if you're looking at improved public transport, it's not just a cost, there are wider costs of not, um, of having poor air, poor air quality as well. Effects on wildlife, um, limited parking spaces, risk to cyclists, school run congestion. So, you know, take your mind back to those, those impacts that we had. And then, you know, high up on terms of, of what you wanted to achieve in the vision outcome was around affordable public transport, fast and reliable public transport. So there's some connection there. And also, you know, being environmental and zero carbon. So these were highly prioritized areas. Um, but also ideas around being people-centered, restricting the city center, um, interconnection, and so on. So today, we are going to be thinking very much about, well, what are the measures in order to get there? And David is just going to give a very quick um, introduction into different measure measures and ingredients that, that get us there. Thanks, David. Okay, so we're going to be looking at a range of measures um, in some detail, and I want to give an overview um, of how to think about how one might think about these measures. So we need to identify a mix of measures, and you need to bear in mind that these may an individual measure may have a single impact or it may have more than one impact, which complicates life a bit. There's quite a lot of uncertainty. Okay. Give me a better one. That's the dark one. <laughs> Is that better? Okay, sorry. Thank you. Um, so we're going to identify a mix of measures over the course of today and tomorrow that will allow your vision to be uh, put into effect. Um, an individual measure may have a single impact or it may have more than one impact. In particular, measures that will raise money, that's one impact, will also do other things as well. The impacts will often be very uncertain. Um, again, if we're going to charge, uh, introduce new charges, there's uncertainty about the level of charge and what impact that might make. So we're going to be focusing on the direction of movement rather than the absolute amount. Um, there are costs of implementing measures and some, as I say, will, will generate revenues. Um, it, broadly, there are three kinds of objective. We want more and better public transport services. We want to reduce air pollution and we want to raise funds to support better public transport. So, thinking about the, these objectives, the main ways to reduce traffic and create more space for buses, cycling and walking are firstly to reduce road space for cars, whether parked or moving. Uh, that's, in my view, the surest way of reducing the volume of traffic. But the second possibility is charging for cars that are moving. And the example in Britain, the main example is the congestion charge uh, in London. The main ways to reduce air pollution, one is to reduce vehicles that are polluting while on the move. Uh, a second is to limit traffic on the most polluting streets. And the third possibility is to promote the uptake of non-polluting vehicles, in particular electric vehicles. You'll hear more details about these possibilities in the course of today. And then the main measures, to, main ways to raise new funds Charging for moving vehicles, I mean, we charge stationary vehicles when parked uh, in various places. We're used to that, but charging for moving vehicles uh, would be a, a new uh, measure for Cambridge. And then we'll hear about a workplace parking levy, a new form of parking charge. Um, there are two kinds of measure. There are existing measures, things we do already, where the authorities have the powers to uh, vary these, 
And so you can introduce measures incrementally. I mean, parking controls are of that kind. But then there are new measures, things we haven't done before, like charging vehicles on the move, which often will be controversial uh, because the people who think they'll be adversely affected will talk up, uh, will express their concerns, and the people who might benefit um, may not express their um, uh, pleasure in the new measures. It's worth thinking also about whether one can trial measures before long-term commitment. Um, the nice example is in Stockholm, where they introduced a congestion charge for a period, and then they turned it off for six months, and the traffic you know, reverted to what it had been. And then they had a vote, a referendum, and the outcome was that they wanted to reintroduce the congestion charge. Uh, and that's been really quite successful. So thinking about how one might trial new measures is worth doing. And the final uh, question is, how ambitious do you want to be? Um, do you want to raise money, funds, from motorists in order to achieve a real improvement in public transport? Or would you be reluctant to do that? Uh, in which case, you need to make the best use of the city deal money that you can, which is money you can spend on capital aspects, uh, but without new revenue funding. And to put this another way, do you want to aim to initiate significant change in travel behavior, shifting away from car use or not? I say initiate because whatever you do, it's a long-term process. And I think the question really is what direction of travel, what, you know, what is the long-term aim? The question of, of how fast you move is, uh, is to do with implementation. Um, so I think this, this is really the, the central question. Do you want to achieve a shift away from car use to public transport, walking and cycling? To do that, you need to raise money from motorists to fund these alternative services. And that, I think, is the, you know, goes to the heart of the question, to my mind. Thank you. Thanks, David. Okay, now we're going to get into the content of these different measures. And um, throughout the day, it's going to be a similar process. So what we're going to do is, first off, we will hear from Lynn, who will talk about the measures, and we're sort of taking them in couples or threes. Um, and she will talk about what the measures are and, and, and a bit about what impact GCP, in terms of some of their analysis, thinks that might have. And then we will draw on um, our, our panellists and they will talk a bit more about, so what are some of the pros and the cons and the considerations if you were thinking about these measures? That's quite a tight, we're giving them quite a tight time frame to do that with because then we'll hear about five minutes from Lynn, about 10 minutes from the panel and then it's back to, and then you will go into your, t uh, your tables to look at those measures and draw on the panellists to bring them to your tables and think through the issues around those particular, uh, around those particular measures. Um, as previously, your yellow cards for slowdown or clarifications, your red cards for, you've lost me, stop, can you repeat that point? They're at your table, so that will apply throughout the day. Um, just really quickly, so, we're, we're, so Lynn Miles, who we heard from on weekend one, is going to be um, starting off. And then our panellists, um, we've got Steve Mellier from um, University of West of England, for the Centre of Transport and Society. We've got uh, Richard McGreevy, you can do a little wave if you want to, um, from Transport for London. And uh, David will, will, will be doing some chipping in. And we've also got Gillian Annabelle from the Institute for Transport Studies from Leeds. And each of them will take a starting lead depending on which measure and where their expertise lies. Um, okay, let's get into it, yeah? Um, Lynn, let's start. So the first two measures that we're going to be talking about, and these are um, closing roads to cars and restricting or removing parking. Morning. Okay, so we've bracketed these two together because um, essentially these two are both about making space by just stopping vehicles being there. 
So the first option then is to close roads to cars. So this is sort of just simply not allowing cars in or other vehicles as well. Could be goods, could be, uh, could, could be goods vehicles. Uh, and there's a range of ways we could do this. Every measure we'll talk about today, there's not one way of doing it, but it's a broad approach. So simply not allowing some vehicles to travel down some roads or down parts of some roads, so you create lanes or you create filters where you get to a certain point in the road and others can continue. You can do this on one road. You can do this in a small neighbourhood area, maybe inside main roads. You can do this across whole swathes of the city. There's a bunch of ways you can do this, and the, the scale at which you do this probably uh, affects the impact quite significantly. But at its basic, arguably the most simplest and effective way to get cars off the road is simply not allow them to drive down there. The real benefit of this is this creates space. It gives you space to allow buses to go quicker. It gives you space to allow uh, pedestrians and cyclists to have a better environment. Really crucially, actually, it probably really changes the feel of a place and the experience of walking and cycling around somewhere. So it will likely to make it safer, more pleasant, a generally nicer atmosphere. Probably public realm and health benefits and well-being benefits around the area that is. So will it reduce congestion? Um, broadly speaking, uh, the analysis we've done suggests that if you really want to reduce congestion overall, those closures would have to be over quite a big area, to be quite substantial. If you just close a road or two, or a small zone or two, it's more likely that the traffic will just divert around it, and so you might have less traffic in one area, but it will be going to other roads instead, and so it's important to think about the area when you think about some of this. If it's individual roads or lanes, you'll get faster movement on that, and it will come at the cost probably of slower movement elsewhere. Same in terms of emissions, so it's likely to be really strongly positive for the areas that you're closing to cars and vehicles. If that traffic doesn't disappear but goes elsewhere, it might have correspondingly negative impacts elsewhere, so it's quite hard to say what the overall impact will be, but broadly, if it's lanes or roads or small zones, we think it's really probably more likely to displacement. It would have to be quite a broad area to do that. Also bearing in mind what we spoke about last weekend, that lots of the growth in where people work is quite spread around the city in a quite a big arc around the edges. It's not concentrated in one place in the city. What it does do is give you lots of creativity, better options. So it's likely that the existing buses that run would be able to run quite a lot faster uh, and give quite a lot better and importantly more reliable service if they weren't sitting in the same traffic as everyone else. Uh, there's, there's just a risk that at the point at which you close off roads, you get a little bit of a sort of bottleneck as all the traffic filters in. Um, the important thing about this is it doesn't depend on income, right? So no one is affected differentially depending on their income. What it also doesn't do, though, is provide any income to support public transport service. So you don't get any more money by this, but the existing services probably run better. Radical closures are going to restrict people's freedom to move and to make choices about where they go and what they do. And, and it's an open question how fair that is. Um, some arrangement would need to be made for delivery and service vehicles. And if people lived inside the zone that would close, their ability to bring their cars to and from their houses. Let me skip on to the next one now. Restricting or removing parking, quite similar issues. This is different to single roads, though, where you're saying... It's a real leveller. If someone can't park at the end of their journey, they can't make their journey in their car. So it's in some senses very fair. So you might take away whole car parks. You might close on-road parking. So lots more yellow lines, lots more resident zones. Uh, you might insist that new development had no parking in it, so people weren't able to park at their home. There's a bunch of ways you could do this. Same effect supply. If you're very radical in that, it could have some quite big impacts. If you're quite incremental in that, it's probably likely to only chip around the edges uh, of car travel demand. Uh, and the, those, in, uh, those impacts knock through then. So if there's a radical change in, in parking availability, it might have big impact on emissions. Uh, and if you're less radical, it's going to have much more incremental. You'd need to think a little bit about um, the extent to which this affects people who rely on on-street parking. In particular, we know around Addenbrookes and in the south, there are lots of nurses and hospital visitors who are currently parking on the streets and residential areas around there, and that might be a difficult thing to go with. 
generally speaking also, residential parking restrictions tend to be really unpopular with people. People don't like it when you make resident zones or say they can't park on the streets near their houses. Uh, and so that's something to think about as well. Uh, and the last thing is to say that that's unlikely to generate any revenue. Occasionally when you have residence zones, you generate some money by permitting people. But by and large, that money more or less covers the cost of running the scheme. It doesn't give you a huge revenue stream that you can then go to fund other public transport. So potentially big impact on road space and making space for other modes, probably much less on revenue, even nothing. Thanks, Lynn. Um, so you will have noticed that Lynn was going through um, her, her pack there. And I just wonder, Lynn, before you hand over the mic, <laughs> do you just want to, it's at the front of people's packs, but do you just want to talk about the key? Because oh, I think yeah, I'm there's lots that. of words in, in these packs, but there's a little key that's up at the top, which we thought was helpful in terms of just yeah. what, what the main focus is. So, so I don't know whether you want to... Um Two things to say about the packs. First of all, the first few pages of your packs contain kind of the things we might want to do, the good stuff, the stuff that's in your vision. That's there for reference. The stuff we're talking about this afternoon is from the page where it says enablers onwards. So that's kind of the focus of how do we make this happen. In terms of the key, we've got these... Um, have I got a laser on here? We've got these up in the corner here. So once again, it's very difficult to be definitive about this because for all these measures, it depends how hard you hit them. But this one basically tells you, does this create road space that you can use for something else? So when you've got road space, you've got space for cyclists, pedestrians, and you've got space for buses to move faster and not sit in traffic jams. So you'll see a little red strike through there if it doesn't make space. This is air quality. This will be black when it has no impact on air quality, and it will go green if it has a positive impact on air quality and emissions. So clothing roads, probably positive, but bear in mind that caveat we said about it might be that it's better in some places and worse than others. On balance, probably positive. And this will just be a sort of neutral if it's not likely to raise revenue or if it's just negligible amounts of revenue, not a lot. It will go green if it's going to raise money, and it will go red if it's going to cost a lot of money and not bring any in. So that's broadly what we're looking at there. And there's Thanks. a key in the front of the pack. Thanks, Lynn. That Try to be consistent. Please don't take it as absolutely definitive. It's just an indication of the direction. Thank you. I think we're, we're hearing that quite a lot. So I actually wonder if our, um, if our panel want to come and take their um, seats up here, because what we're going to do is we're going to hear from Gillian first um, in terms of... I've got some more... Or in terms of a kind of response of other things that you might want to think about. And then I think Steve will probably come in as well. And if we've got any more time, we'll hear from the other, some of the other panellists. Um, you all right there, Jill? <laughs> so, Gillian, what are some of the other things that people need to think about okay. in relation to those two measures? All right, thank you. Um, th and hi, everybody. Um, really, this is just so fascinating to, to be here and think about these issues. Sorry, yeah, got to remember to do that. Okay, um, now I've been asked to talk about this issue of closing roads. I prefer to call it road space reallocation, as Lynn has outlined. It's, that's a much more positive way of thinking about it. And just to start off, I thought I'd say to you that uh, what we're all in uh, right now is something called a social dilemma. Yeah? So a social dilemma is where, at an individual level, let's take this topic specifically, at an individual level, by and large, people's ideal is that everybody else gets on the bus so that they can have a nice journey, pleasant cycle ride or, or car ride, okay? So that's, an in, that's, that's the individual ideal, by and large. I'm not sort of accusing anybody of, of this stance. Um, but for society, for us at large, the ideal is that everybody gets on the bus and or at least a large proportion of people get out of their car so that those on the bus or cycling or walking, have all have a better time. So then everybody wins. That's the ideal. And um, the, uh, the, the issue about... Um, uh, the, the problem is that not everybody gets out of their car, or very few people get out of their car. So we need some pushes for that to happen, um, because otherwise it's not going to. Now... Um, one of the things about road space reallocation that I noticed, Lynn, Lynn said mo mostly said it all, but I'm going to take issue a little bit with the zero cost side here, that it's neutral. <coughs> Clearly, 
just closing roads is not a revenue generating measure in and of itself. However, one of the reasons that public transport is, or buses in particular, are so expensive is because their operating environment is expensive. They are competing with the car. When they have a much more favourable operating environment, they have more ability to be reliable, they have more space on the roads, they can be more reliable. They're not competing with lots of sort of free, particularly free car parking, um, so that uh, for the individual car journey, it feels cheaper to do it that way. When they haven't got that, that stuff to compete with, they can operate much more efficiently and can, can reduce their fares. So in that sense, it's, it's not neutral in terms of revenue in that way. Also, the evidence shows, and Lynn outlined, I think, a little bit of this, the fact that when, when roads are closed, the only uh, time, really, that the, um, the, there's a success story around that, really, from a network and a whole kind of area point of view, is when that's done fairly comprehensively. One road here, one road there doesn't make a huge amount of difference. Um, but there have been a lot of studies reviewing the evidence around the world of where roads have been closed, that either because of a planned closure or actually possibly because of a natural disaster, some kind of issue has meant uh, bridge, large brig, bridge and network uh, closures. And at, at, on an average, 20% of traffic disappears. Now, obviously, on the roads themselves, 100% disappears, yeah? But in the network around those roads, uh, about 20% traffic reduction is achieved. Um, and slightly beyond that, there's a tiny little bit of an increase, but, no, but, but that 80% hasn't jumped just to the next layer out. It has disappeared completely. And that's because there is quite a lot of discretionary car use on the road. We don't sort of think there is, but there is a lot of single occupancy vehicles. There, are, there is some scope for some movement, so those that can move tend to, and particularly if the public transport offer is, is actually improved as a result of, of the extra space that, that's um, allocated. And the, the particular study I have in mind was done 15, 20 years ago, reviewed 100 examples of this around the world. And two of those, incidentally, were in Cambridge. But as I say, this was back in the early 2000s, so the context is different. And in Cambridge, the average was around 10% of traffic disappeared on these particular routes that were studied. So it is proven to work. And it is always controversial, it's very difficult to imagine, but just like the example before about congestion charging, what tends to happen is lots and lots of, of resistance to it, but once it actually happens, um, actually a lot of uh, appreciation of it and also a lot of economic benefit in terms of the revenue, the, ex the, the footfall in retail areas and the revenue that's generated in that way. Thanks, Julian. Steve, I know that you wanted to make a couple of points. Yeah, thank you. Um, before I get on to parking, um, just to go back to something that Lynn had said earlier on about filtering. Now, that, that may be a, a, an important element of the things that you want to listen to. Um, I did a, a little bit of work on, on this um, a, a few years ago. The, the Cambridge Core Traffic Scheme, which was done in stages from the sort of mid-1990s until the early 2000s. Right, so that, that was the programme for those of you who were living here when places like Bridge Street and Emmanuel Street and that were, were closed to through traffic but filtered. You, you all understand what we mean by, by filtered. So, you know, something like a bollard or a bus gate that means, you know, bikes can get through, maybe buses can get through, but general traffic can't. That had a big impact on uh, travel behaviour, also possibly on car ownership in Cambridge. Cambridge was a, a rare example of a city which was seeing rapidly rising um, incomes and rapidly falling levels of car ownership. Normally, those two things go together. So Cambridge was a very interesting example of where those two went in opposite directions. Um, so. Park, getting on to parking, now these things are linked. Um, 
availability of parking, right? The, the, evident, the evidence on this, by the way, we'll talk a lot about evidence and uh, in general terms, it's always messy. It's difficult to prove anything. But um, th there is a kind of very strong weight of evidence that says that the availability of parking is one of the key determinants of travel in general. Um, that applies both in destinations, like, you know, can you park at work, can you park at, near shops, hospital, and also in residential areas, you know, how many vehicles can you keep in the place where you live? Um, the, uh, this is, of course, is very controversial for reasons that I'm sure you can, you can all work out for yourselves. Um, but uh, the, the, there are, in, in many places, car ownership is falling simply because the, uh, the, the availability to park cars is not there. Now, the, one of the key issues about that is uh, over, overspill and control. Uh, if you control in one area, um, does it just overspill to the others? So you, you need to kind of think about that and you know for it to be effective um, the now the other key issue about this is um, suppressed demand which I think um, uh, David has already mentioned so this is the the problem with many of the measures that we're talking about you do something to take a vehicle off the road and it frees up space for another one to take its place I'm uh, going to be coming back to that this afternoon. Now that, so if you ask the question, what difference do parking measures make to congestion? Well, that may be quite limited for that reason. You know, so for example, if you take away the sort of available street parking in a, a particular area and there's less, there are fewer people going there to park, well then that frees up more space for the people who were driving through as through traffic. One of the ways where sort of parking restrictions might have a much bigger impact is where they are combined with modal filtering. So I, I think in fact Cambridge City Centre at the moment is probably an example of that. If you take away the through routes, right, so you can't, you literally cannot drive through, you can only drive in and out, and then you limit the amount of parking within that particular area. So that limits the number of people who are going in and out. And because the area has been filtered, it's not possible for other vehicles then just to take their place. So the, it, for particular areas, those two measures might be effective uh, in combination. Although obviously there is then the issue about displacement outside. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to not give David and Richard a chance to add anything else to that because what I, they will have their chance. I'm not being super mean to them. Um, so what, uh, what we want to do now is so we've, we've there looked at two measures. Okay, closing roads to cars and restricting or removing parking. You've had a bit of a run through about what they are and a few kind of pointers on some things that might you might want to consider now we want you to go back into back to your tables and to think about that so given those two measures just to start off with what do you think are some of the pros the benefits and the cons the downsides of this measure do you understand what these measures are and what some of the trade-offs are what are some of the considerations if that was to go forward we're not having a Q&A, but absolutely these people are here to help you. So if you do have questions, hold up your blue card. They are, they are proactively here to come and answer your questions on your tables as well. Okay? So you have about 40 minutes to get to grips with those two measures. Okay? 40. 40, not 14. <laughs> okay. Okay? Is that okay, table facilitators? <laughs> and 
and then uh, I, I, and then we've just got a quick video to, to watch, and and then it's lunch. So Peter, take it away. Uh, okay. So so conscious, I only have a couple of minutes. Um, we touched upon this briefly at the last the last weekend. The short answer is that stagecoach provide bus services to make money. So so in the short term, any increase in patronage or an increase in ticket revenue would go to stagecoach and ultimately would go to their shareholders. The slightly longer nuanced answer is that the public sector does have mechanisms whereby through partnerships or contractual arrangements, we can manage and try and mitigate that. So for example, if we agreed as part of an approach, and just picking on the topic you talked about last time, as part of the approach, we were going to reduce parking that would enhance bus services that would lead to a wider benefit, we would want to try and reach an agreement with Stagecoach whereby all of that money just didn't go off to, to, to Scotland in terms of shareholder profit, but actually brought fares down. And, you know, there have been some fair sort of trials that Stagecoach are doing at the moment. The pound trial in the, uh, the, the, the south of the city they're exploring at the moment. Um, so there is the opportunity to do that. But it's not as straightforward as if you're in, in Richard's environment in London, where all of the it's a franchised environments, so first frequencies and everything else, is, is, is sort of managed by Transport for London. And just a final point, and I'll shut up. But some of you did raise the, the idea of a transport for Cambridge. Um, and it may be that that was part of your thinking, that in terms of any package, you would want to see that being a far more public uh, control or influence on the, on the bus network. Yep. Thanks, Peter. Um, so you're getting the gist of how we're going to run these panels. And after lunch, you get to do it again. Um, but I'm just going to pass over to Tim. Thanks, Sue. So uh, one last thing before lunch. Uh, so as you know, the Citizen Assembly has been open to anybody above the age of 16 uh, to take part in. Uh, but of course, these issues are issues going to uh, affect future generations, going to affect young people today. So we did want to include kind of a voice of young people uh, in the Citizen Assembly just to, to give you some, some food for thought. Uh, and Cambridgeshire has some young travel ambassadors who, um, who help to advise around kind of travel issues. So we've got a short video uh, from three of those uh, young travel ambassadors just to give a kind of a sense of their uh, experience of um, of travel and, uh, and the issues we're discussing um, and we're just going to play that for you now. Well, I use the college bus to get to college every day, which means I'm totally dependent on it. So when it's late, I'm late to school and back, and that is not rare since there's a lot of congestion in this area. So um, I walk here from Meldriff, and we, our family, do not have a car, so we take the train to Royston and Cambridge, and if we can, we cycle everywhere. Well, I get around mostly by bike. Literally always. Well, either they carpool, they just take lift, or they, well, yeah, they use the bus, which just adds to the amount of traffic in this place and the fumes. So, um, my friend who lives in Shepriff, he takes the bus, and my friend who lives here also walks. Most of my friends get around by car, but my best friend Ruby, she uses her bike a lot too. But she hasn't ever ridden as long a distance as I have. <laughs> well, preferably I would cycle, because then I can just go whenever I want to, right? Right. I can stay at school or how long I want. Doesn't matter. I decide. So why don't you cycle? Well, because of the 18th roundabout. I mean, it's so dangerous, you just can't cross it normally. Plus, the amount of fumes that just really affect my asthma. So, I mean, I need some way to get through that. Do you think that if there were a cycle link to school, a safe cycle link, that you would use it and be in a position to persuade your friends to use it? Oh, yeah. I mean, a lot of my friends said that they would be seriously interested in a thing like this. Plus, my siblings who are coming in the next few years. Like, yeah, we would all use it. A lot of people. We do not currently cycle to Royston. And is that 
for a particular reason? It's because the roads to get there are not very safe. Well, this is why the Cambridge to Royston cycle path would be very convenient for us. Yeah. The bicycle bridge to Royston. Ah, uh, and yes. No, not really. <laughs> Do you cycle on the road very often? Sometimes. Right, okay. There's not really that much traffic around, but my mum and dad, they say there always should be a pair of watching me. Because and there are big roads. Because what? There are really big roads. Really big roads, right. Uh, so thank you to the uh, Young Travel Ambassadors for uh, producing that video for us. And it is now lunchtime. We're going to give you 45 minutes for lunch. Uh, so if you can uh, be back in here for 12.45. Uh, lunch is where it was um, before, so just out uh, down the corridor. Um, and yeah, 45 minutes. Welcome back, everyone. So uh, it seems we had a bit of a bottleneck around the um, uh, meat eater, eater station today, creating a quite a sizable tailback. Uh, so sorry for that, and sorry for the wait for, for some people for, for dinner. We'll try and, uh, I guess, optimise our, uh, uh, our uh, congestion tomorrow to make sure that you get it as quickly as possible. Uh, God, what's, <laughs> what's happened to me? Like... First weekend, I was making jokes about Westlife, and this weekend, I'm, it's all about travel, so something's kind of obviously filtering in. Um, so before we kick off this afternoon session, there were a couple of points that kind of came up around tables consistently that we just wanted to get a bit of clarification around, so we we'll asked Peter to, uh, to say a few words uh, about those. Thanks, Tim. Um, so I think a couple of issues. One was around the motorist and views of the, the, the motorist. It... it, it it's important that the motorist has been involved and continues to be involved in this process. So we have an advisory group that supports uh, the development of the process and all of the, the information that's been put, put to you. And the, the RAC Foundation have been part of that to make sure that this is portrayed in a, in a balanced process. And I think we've also been, it's also quite important to say that, you know, we're, we're emphasizing the travel to work area. So people coming in from further afield, a lot of them do drive. So in your considerations, this isn't just about saying restricting here and doing that. It's about saying understanding all road users, motorists, walking, cycling, public transport need to be considered in your deliberations and, and then just stretching that uh, that point a little bit further um, this isn't just about your your conversation this morning on restricting parking or, or, or reducing access or it, you need to be just considering this in the round we might consider restricting parking if there is better public transport or if there's more cycle facilities so I think it's important that you, that you look at this as a package so that we might consider this, but only if this happens uh, in terms of that. Does, that. does that sort of pick up on the points? Yeah. Thank you. And just to give you a sense of kind of what's going to happen tomorrow, uh, so you can kind of see how this all fits together. So tomorrow there will be kind of a series of votes around these different measures. There will also be a chance to, to think about like, the key messages that you want to send back to, to GCP. And some of those messages might be around kind of conditions and things that might need to be in place if any of these, uh, uh, if any of these measures are going to be introduced. And so all of, the, all of the information, all of the stuff that you're coming up with uh, today um, we're, overnight, we're going to, to draw out the key points that come out from all of the tables, so you'll have something to refer back to when you're doing those votes, and that will include the, the considerations as well. Uh, so then when we're thinking about, so if these measures are going to be introduced, what are the key things that need to be in place, you'll have all of this work to refer back to. So this is all kind of a, um, all a bit of a, kind of a stepping stone towards um, what's going to happen uh, tomorrow. So... Next up in the programme 
Uh, we have the, the set of measures around uh, road pricing. So I'm going to ask uh, Lynn to come and introduce those. Thank you. Um, so first off, I want to say that we're about to talk through three measures, which in a sense are sort of on a continuum of the same thing. This is all about the principle of whether or not we want to ask people to pay for driving uh, and, and which vehicles. The, the measures we go through talk about differences and principles about who would pay that charge, which type of vehicle. Um, so we start off with a clean air zone, which I guess in some ways is sort of the entry point onto that. Lots of talk about a clean air zone at the moment, lots of cities thinking about this, really focused on cleaning up the air in places where air quality is unacceptable. So in this context, for the purposes of this conversation, when I talk about a clean air zone, I mean one that charges buses, vans, light goods vehicles, uh, heavy goods vehicles, but doesn't charge cars. It's possible to have a clean air zone that does. For this, we're talking about not charging cars, just buses, vans, and what have you. You heard from Joe last week that most of the air quality problem in cities that's caused by traffic is caused by those types of vehicles. Really, most of the traffic is cars. Most of the emissions are from those big, dirty, smelly vehicles. Um, this is a charge that would essentially do a huge amount to clean up air by deterring that. And it would do that in one of two ways. Either uh, the businesses running those vehicles would get cleaner vehicles, they'd still keep driving, they'd still keep doing their thing, but they'd have to invest in clean vehicles and the air would clean up notably as a result of that. Or they'd carry on driving their dirty, smelly vehicles and they'd pay the charge. Some of them might not drive at all, but it's probably likely that uh, most of those trips are sort of non-negotiables. Unlike sort of personal car travel where you may do a trip you don't need to do, by and large those trips are going to be trips that need to be made. Some of them might divert to a bigger area, but because traffic is bad in the city anyway, by and large HGVs and things that don't need to go in the city um, generally won't. So for that reason, probably really quite a large impact on air quality, probably a relatively small impact on making space on the roads, probably not many fewer vehicles on the roads, uh, and a little bit less congestion if there is, but not a lot. Uh, not likely to raise huge amounts of money. Some money will change hands, but actually, if sort of the policy really is targeted at getting people to upgrade the vehicles uh, rather than to, to sort of stop the traffic, so the money raised probably would cover costs and maybe give a little bit more, but not a big money raiser. In terms of who this would affect, then, this is basically two groups of people that would be affected. That would be the businesses running those vehicles in the first place, and it would be people travelling on public transport because the cost of buses... Comp uh, complying with this would be then passed on through ticket prices um, unless uh, there was some sort of public subsidy for the upgrading of the buses. So that largely got borne by business and a little bit by public transport users. The next step on the journey then is what we're sort of calling a pollution charge for the sake of clarity here. At this point you say, right, we're charging cars as well. Yes. Uh, apologies, that's probably a typo. To be, so as I say, this is actually a continuum. We've tried to stylize it into three points on a continuum. Actually, you can make a decision about any of these. I think in a standard uh, clean air zone uh, of the type we just described, it would be sort of black cabs would be included, but regular car taxis would not be. So pollution charge, then you bring cars into the mix. You ask cars to pay as well. Um, and, but you really want to include in that some sort of incentive for there to be clean cars, and so you maybe exclude the cleanest cars. So clean cars don't have to pay, dirty cars do have to pay. So again, it's sort of trying to focus a little bit on congestion and air quality, and it's trying to get that incentive there. And I told you last week, and I'm an economist, so I, you know, we like incentives. If you want people to move to cleaner vehicles, this is one way to maybe help push them to do that more quickly. Um, so you have some people who are driving paying and some people not. Therefore, you'd expect that would have more of an impact on congestion than only charging those big vehicles that probably aren't going to change their behaviour anyway, but less than if all cars were charged. Uh, and in sort of thinking about... Go on, question. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yeah. So probably a pollution charge where some people who drove would have to pay, but people in the cleanest vehicles wouldn't, would have less congestion, would have more congestion impact than just charging buses, lorries and what have you, but less than if all the cars paid, sort of for the obvious reasons. And then the sort of last point on the continuum is a charge where now really the focus is on congestion 
as opposed to air quality, where we're saying we're asking people to pay to drive because we want to reduce congestion. So it would impact on all those ones that came forward, but now you'd ask all cars. Whether or not they're clean cars, you ask all cars to pay. Now, as with any of these three options, you can choose to fix that at a certain time of day or a certain day of the week or different zones, but in principle, all cars would be paying this. It is possible in the near future there will be technology to do this via an app, so you might have a different charge for a different route. If you take a less congested route, you'd pay less. If you take a more congested route, you pay more. But this is the principle that what you're trying to affect here is people driving cars. So it has the air quality impact, also the congestion impact. So of all of them, this is probably going to have the biggest impact on congestion of the three types. The pollution charge and the flexible charge will have less, each time you add someone in it has less impact. The real big win from an emissions point of view is the first one with buses, taxis, uh, heavy goods vehicles, because that's where most of the emissions gain comes. And then when you add cars on top, it helps, but the big win is the first bit. Uh, and this flexible charge, charging all cars, would have the most revenue raised in all likelihood because everyone is liable to pay it. So that's the sort of three points on the scale that we're talking about. Fantastic. Uh, thank you, Lynn. Um, so can I call the other panellists up? And I think we're going to go to, uh, to Richard first this time to, to give some thoughts around these measures. Good afternoon. Can you all hear me? Um, I'm Richard McGreevy. I work for Transport for London, but the, the views I will express um, over the next sort of five minutes, um, they're my own views, uh, that, that, that sort of disclaimer, they're not TfL's views, but I'm not going to say anything too controversial. Um, so charging for roads, it, it's a concept that's um, it's, it's not particularly new. It's been around for some years. It got some academic credence in the 1960s, and... Um, there are two schemes in the country at the moment. There's one in Durham, which is a, a small scheme. Uh, you, pay, you pay £2 for access to, to an area. And the larger scheme is in central London, um, covers 21 square uh, kilometres. And um, I'll give a, a brief background about some of the issues that we went through when we, when we designed that scheme. Um, now, you might say that motorists already pay uh, to use the roads. They pay their vehicle exercise duty, uh, their road tax, as they might call it. Uh, the fuel duty and the VAT, but the key thing about those charges is that uh, you're not paying for um, a, a charge that's linked to where you drive and when you drive and, and arguably the, the impact you, you make in different places and at different times of day and the impact you make on other motorists with the congestion you cause. And I know that we all, you know, I, I always blame the person in front of me for the congestion when I'm, when I'm driving uh, rather than myself. <clears throat> And um, in London, we, we introduced a scheme in 2003, and all of the mayoral candidates, well, that was a controversial scheme. All of the candidates were backing the introduction of the scheme, and the government at the time nicely gave us a big uh, pot of money to introduce the scheme, and they did lots of research as well so that we could hit the ground running. And that probably saved uh, two or three years in, uh, in delivery, because a mayoral term in London is four years, and, you, and you, you're struggling to get big things in like that within four years. It operates between 7 a.m. and 6 p.m. at five, five days a week, the scheme. You pay £11.50 uh, to enter the zone. You only pay the charge once per day, and then you can drive around the zone as much as you want. It's a flat charge. It's, um, it's policed using uh, cameras on the edge of the zone and uh, some mobile cameras that, that move around the zone to catch motorists. Uh, there's a 100% discount for people with blue badges, and for um, cleaner vehicles, for electric cars, they, 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 don't, they don't pay the congestion charge. And if you don't pay the charge within 48 hours, uh, we don't just say, that's oh, okay, you know, just pay us in a couple of weeks' time. Um, the fines are quite hefty, so it's a £160 fine. I think it's uh, £80 if you pay it within the first 14 days. So to you know, chase those fines and uh, to... Uh, make the charge work, there's a big, there's a big back office and there's, uh, there's a big running cost um, in, in operating a scheme like the congestion charge, in, anywhere. Uh, that's a great question, I'll have to come back to it. I, I don't know off the top of my head, but I can, but I, I can, I can find out. I, I think non-charge payment now is, 
it's pretty small because the the, the system of um, of of collecting is is pretty draconian. Okay, so um, the impacts of the scheme. Well, you know, why did we do it? So it, it was primarily it was to uh, reduce congestion in central London, and that's the main commercial. Um, it, it's in the main commercial part of of London. Not many people live there themselves, and to get the scheme in. We also had to introduce a residence discount. So if you, if you live in the charge zone, you get a 90% discount. I should have mentioned that. So you only pay 10% of the charge. Um, and that works in central London, London because not many people live there. So its main objective was to reduce congestion. And in the first couple of years of um, introducing the scheme, it, it had that. Um, important success. So congestion went down 30% within the zone during charging hour, hours, and the number of vehicles was, uh, went down in the, charge, in, in the zone during charging hours by 20%. So it, of, of, uh, it achieved its, its objectives. Uh, but then over time, it's important to say that congestion started to creep up again in uh, central London. And after 16 years, uh, the, the levels of congestion are probably where they were at pre-charging levels. But the important distinction to make is that central London is a completely different place to what it was 16 years ago. So pavements have been widened, we've got more crossings, more bus lanes, more, uh, more cycle lanes. Um, we've pedestrianised larger areas. Uh, famously, Trafalgar Square was partly pedestrianised. Uh, the northern uh, arm of, of the roundabout was uh, pedestrianised. So we're not, we're not comparing like with like, and the world has moved on, and we've achieved lots of other policy goals, which, um, which L Londoners love. In addition to the congestion charge we, in central London, we have what's called the ultra-low emission zone, and this has a, a pollution a reduction focus, and we have, a, a, like many towns uh, in the UK, there's, a poor air, there's an air quality problem in London, a public health problem, and the ultra-low emission zone in uh, Central London, at ULEV for short, it um, operates seven days a week, um, 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. So it's, it, hours of operation are different to the congestion charge. And it, the, the charge is set on the emission levels of, of your vehicle. And you, you, you may know that um, vehicles are, are, their emission levels are graded uh, by the EU and we've based the charge on, on that, those emission levels. So without getting too technical, um, and there are some very sort of simple, uh, 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 help, um, helpful websites which indicate how much you're going to pay depending on the vehicle you've got. Uh, the charge is, is £12.50 if you have a, a diesel car or a diesel van that doesn't meet a Euro 6 limit, or, do, or a petrol van or car that doesn't meet a Euro uh, 4 uh, limit. In addition, there's an 100 pound charge for, for lorries over three and a half tonnes to enter the ultra low emission zone um, if they don't meet the Euro 6 limit. In terms of um, positives of the scheme, road user charging schemes are flexible. You can uh, change their area. They could be, uh, cover a small area, a large area. You can base the charge on the type of vehicle, the type of emissions, the engine size, the fuel type. You can um, change uh, the charge based upon uh, wh wh when the charge is imposed. So there's a big, uh, there was a, um, a big, so, the, so, so um, there was a relatively big uh, PR campaign, and I won't, I won't say it covered, but it, it was, it was, it was pr pretty comprehensive, and it's still, it's still, still going on. So this might be one of the considerations when you get on to, to thinking about kind of how, how it might be introduced. No, yeah. So it's a good thought. Hold it and make sure it gets um, recorded on the considerations. Yeah, it's a good it's a good point, and I think 
uh, the comms and PR for any schemes always need to be uh, need, need to be refreshing them and making sure that you're hitting the target audience. Um, where did I get to? No, no, that's <laughs> that's fine. Um, so, in in the positives are the scheme can be very very flexible. You can consider exemptions and discounts. Um, you can think about um, what, what sort of technology you might use. We, in London, we went for a very traditional uh, form of technology using. Uh, cameras to, to monitor entry and exit of the zone, but other schemes think about using black boxes fitted to cars that are very similar to uh, what insurance companies already ask people to, to fit to their cars to achieve a discount for their car insurance. Some of the negative impacts, well obviously th th there's a, f a fairness uh, impact, um, impact on low income workers uh, is that are reliant on their cars are often cited uh, as uh, has a negative problem with the zone. But within central London, and within London generally, uh, those on the very lowest incomes don't drive. They're, they're reliant on public transport, so they, they benefit from schemes like this. There'll be lots of pressure to grant exemptions, and you need to be very careful about uh, increasing the complexity of the scheme and the understanding of the scheme. And if you um, introduce so many exemptions, then it's not very likely to make much money or have much impact. It needs a big shift in culture, politically, uh, technically, that, that we have the tools to introduce schemes like this, but it's a, it's a big ask of a mayor or of uh, councillors to introduce a scheme such as this. Uh, the upfront costs can be very high because you have to put in the complementary measures, the improved bus services, better walking and cycling facilities before the scheme goes in. You, you can't expect, I think, people to pay the charge and then have to wait five, ten years before uh, they see the improvement in public transport. <laughs> Um, and lastly, uh, an issue that was never borne out, there was big concern when the congestion charge went in in 2003 about civil liberties and tracking of citizens, but though, in my opinion, those concerns were never, were never borne out in, in reality. Well, yeah, by, by, by Google, I think. <laughs> Thanks, Richard. We've got uh, a couple of minutes for additional points from the other panellists. You, Steve? There's a, there's a sunset period of uh, two years for them to act, uh, and then when the ULES is um, expanded to cover the north and south circular in, in, um, in, in inner London, so it, we're pro proposing to expand it over the next couple of years, that sunset period will, uh, will run out. So at the moment, they do have a discount. So you would expect them to get things in quite fast? Yes. A few points. Um, firstly, um, Bear in mind, where this has, there have been attempts to introduce congestion charging in other British cities, we've had two instances of a referendum which went strongly against right, Manchester and Edinburgh. Um, two, three reasons why the, the London scheme didn't achieve the congestion benefits that the people had hoped. Um, Richard has already mentioned the, you know, the reuse of space. So you, you take space away uh, when you've got more available um, for other purposes. Secondly, the, the, the nature of the, the composition of the traffic has radically changed because there are certain types of vehicles that are not charged. So we come back to this same issue of suppressed demand. You take some of the cars off the road, uh, private hire vehicles, including Uber and that, are not charged. No, so there's been a very, very big increase in those. There was also, at the beginning, a very big increase in, in buses, and that was part of the whole plan. So what you've actually got is similar flows of vehicles, but they're now carrying more people in and out. So all of that was good. But the London version of the congestion charge is a really blunt instrument where you, you, know, you draw a circle and you say you cross that and it's X pounds per day. The potential, and that's what's on this sheet, is for a flexible scheme. Um, I believe, I don't know the details, but I believe that Singapore has done something a bit more like that, uh, but not quite to that degree of sophistication. What I would say, of all of the measures that you have in front of you here, um, I, honestly, I think only that one, the flexible congestion charge, is really going to make any difference to congestion. Maybe people don't want that. Maybe people would feel, under any circumstance, I just do not think it's right to pay. 
In which case, I would invite ev everybody, including the politicians, to just let's be honest with ourselves and say, are we really saying, we all moan about congestion, but we would really not willing to do something about it. Let's park it, let's live with that, because there are loads of other problems that we could solve. Thank you. David? Um, I am a bit sceptical about congestion charging as a means of reducing congestion in the long run. In the short run, you introduce a charge, and some people who are cost sensitive will be deterred. Um, but as uh, has been said, uh, there's plenty of suppressed demand that can then emerge from people who are less cost sensitive to take up the space. Now, Singapore, um, has, as uh, Steve mentioned, is a place where you could say congestion charging worked. Um, it's a flexible charge. It, they vary it every quarter to reflect whether the traffic is faster or slower than their target road speeds. But Singapore is a very special case because it's a city-state with no rural hinterland. And they've always had a policy of limiting car ownership to match the capacity of the road network. And they do that by requiring car owners to pay quite a large sum of money for a 10-year certificate of ownership. They auction these certificates in limited numbers. And when I last checked, it cost you £40,000 to own a car in Singapore for 10 years. Now, the impact of that is to constrain car ownership in Singapore to about 100 cars per thousand population, compared with Britain, where we have 450 cars per thousand. So the effect is that uh, road pricing in Singapore has two elements, a fixed charge for having a car to use at all, and then a more modest variable charge to reflect the level of congestion. But the overall level of charging for road use in Singapore is very high. And my view is in a city like Cambridge, or, or London for that matter, to make a real impact on congestion long term, you would have to have really quite high charges. But on the other hand, <clears throat> by introducing uh, congestion charging in Cambridge, it, it, you will reduce traffic initially, and you can take advantage of that traffic reduction to reallocate road space to buses, uh, cyclists, walkers. You will also generate revenue, which you can use to help fund your buses. So on balance, I believe congestion charging in Cambridge would be quite a good idea. OK. Um, so I think we've probably heard enough from the panellists for now, if it's all right, Gillian. Um, so just want to make sure that your time isn't cut short to be thinking about these uh, measures in detail. And you'll have the panellists to be able to draw on uh, as before uh, in the next session. And we're, we're hearing a lot of the complexity around this. We're here, starting to hear actually how some of these measures can be used in conjunction as well. And we'll be getting on to a bit more of discussion about that tomorrow. Uh, but for now, we want you to take each measure in turn, uh, similar as before. So you'll have 20 minutes uh, for each measure just to be thinking through those pros, the cons and the considerations. So I'll hand over to your table facilitators to, to lead that. Um, so don't worry, we've still got some time. So T is beckoning, however, we're going to just go through a couple of measures before the, um, before the cookies. There are cookies out there. <laughs> so, I know, cookies were popular, weren't they? Um, so we're now going to, uh, again, hear from Lynn, and here we are talking about parking prices. But I know, Lynn, you were going to say a couple of things first. Um, about um, ring fencing and revenues and things like that. Ring fencing, wasn't it? Ring fencing. Yep, so someone asked me, and I wanted to make sure that everyone in the room knew, in case it wasn't clear enough, the premise was that any transport charge revenue would be ring fenced to pay for transport, public transport, walking or cycling. So it wouldn't go into the general coffers, it would be very firmly ring fenced uh, for that purpose. So just for clarity. The 
question was, can we clarify whether that is ring fence to be given to tra Cambridge Transport as a whole, not to be passed to Stagecoach uh, to sort of underwrite their shareholders? Uh, yes, so I think the intention... Uh, yes, I am not an expert on the mechanics of exactly how financing works. So I'm going to... Yes, but it will be used for priorities determined for improving public transport and getting a better service here whether some of that money then was used to, uh, to support stagecoach services, but it would be used to support services that they wouldn't otherwise run. And there, as, as Peter said earlier, there'd be a mechanism to make sure that there was fairness there and that wasn't just giving money away. Right, charges, pa uh, parking. Thank you. Right, so we've talked a little bit about, uh, in the morning, we've talked a bit about just stopping people driving or parking altogether, just sort of banning it or restricting it in some way. We then went on to talk a little bit about charging people to drive and the various different ways you could do that and the different vehicles you could use. This section then is talking about charging or charging more for people parking. So there are two principal ways that we see you doing this. Number one is the workplace parking levy. The idea there is that you charge businesses who have car parking spaces that they give to their employees and you put a charge on them for each space that they use. So the businesses pay the money to you. Uh, and there are a couple of different ways you could implement this. And, in, and to be honest, the way you implemented it would depend really on what you wanted to get out of it. So if your primary focus was on either raising revenue to fund public transport or on stopping people driving by restricting parking, you probably would want people to just get rid of their spaces. You'd sort of charge the businesses and hope that actually they might close their car parks, even maybe they'd do something more interesting build houses on it or make a park or something nice with that space that currently is given to car parking. If you were more interested in deterring individuals from driving, you probably would um, decide that you structured your charge so that you part paid for a space on a given day depending on whether or not it was used. If you're more interested in just trying to get people to get rid of their car parks or to get a secure revenue stream, you might say, just say it costs this pound per month to, for a parking space to exist whether or not it's used. That doesn't have so much of an impact on demand then, because once the space is paid for, you might as well drive. The other big thing with a workplace parking levy that would be outside of our control would be where the businesses chose to pass that cost on to drivers or not. So Nottingham is the best example in this country of a city that's done that. They have a workplace parking levy of, if I recall correctly, about £450 a year per space. Uh, and then about 43% of employers that are liable pass that charge on. So they ask their employees to cover the cost of that if they wish to use a space. Um, the GCP would not be able to control whether or not businesses passed it on. The charge would be made of businesses. It would be up to businesses. And so correspondingly, the extent to which that would affect any individual driver's behaviour would be slightly outside of our control. You would probably expect that some drivers would be charged and some drivers would not, depending on how benevolent their employer was. It's also worth noting that some people choose to exclude small businesses from this because it's potentially quite expensive for them. Uh, but that's one option. The other thing to note on demand and how much it frees up road space is there might be these longer term effects where if you charge people a flat rate for the existence of a space, nothing might happen in the first few years. After a few years, businesses might get fed up of paying. They might sell off their land and then you sort of have knock on impacts on demand in the long term. Those are hard to predict. Um, but essentially, with a workplace parking levy, you are probably going to generate some road space. Some people are probably going to be deterred from driving, um, but probably fewer than if you charge them directly, because some of them just won't pay it, because the businesses will pay instead. You will probably make some minor contribution towards air quality, but quite a lot less than, say, a clean air zone, because only some of the drivers will pay it and be deterred. But also, importantly, because this does nothing for buses or HGVs or those really polluting vehicles that are causing most of the emissions problem. So this, is, has, this would have a, a lower impact on air quality, but it would generate quite a secure revenue stream that you could use then to fund public transport. And that revenue stream would probably mostly come from businesses, sometimes from drivers if it's passed on. There was a question over here. That would absolutely be an option, yeah. With any of these options we're talking about, there are always 
questions about how you would frame it, whether you'd choose to exempt people, and we would, I think the plan is to come to that tomorrow. If you go down this route, you might want to think about this or that or the other. But yes, absolutely, that's an option. So you could think about who you're targeting. Yeah, it's a good question. So Tesco's isn't for workers, but the people that work at Tesco's will park there. I guess I would be working on the assumption that probably wouldn't be included. I'm sure it would be possible to come up with a scheme that did include that. But just as you say, they're mostly customers. Can we, yeah. take, can we take those? We can take those onto the tables, I've definitely. Got the, one. the other option, just to go, is, is parking charges. So if you drive into a car park and pay, or if you stay in an on-street spot, you could potentially charge many more on-street spots if you wanted. You could put up the price of the car parks where you already are parking. This is probably going to have a relatively limited impact on commuting traffic, so maybe people that commute, park in a workplace parking thing. So this is probably more likely to affect people who are driving for leisure or for one-off business trips or for any of the other reasons that people drive around that isn't going to work, which are many. Uh, it's likely to have a relatively minimal impact on congestion for that reason. So the majority of the big congestion trips are sort of peak flows, uh, of commuter traffic at the peak times. It will probably have a little impact on that, but not a lot, because most of these trips aren't travelling at peak times. Correspondingly within that, it may have some impact on air quality in as far as that goes. But once again, that wouldn't be impacting on those big polluters of the buses and the HGVs and what have you. So it's going to be a relatively minimal impact on air quality. And it will generate some money, which could be ring fence, but less money than, say, a workplace parking levy. We expect this to be a sort of relatively modest improvement here, but you could put the two together, potentially, and then you would be covering most trips. So Thank these are options. Thank you, Lynn. Um, Steve, do you want to come up? And actually, the rest of the panel, if you want to jump up on your stools. Um, but Steve was going to uh, kick off the responses and considerations around that. Thanks. <coughs> Thank you. Yeah. <coughs> going back to the reiterate the statement I made earlier on, which is that the evidence shows that it is availability of parking which has the, the, the greatest impact on travel decisions rather than charging. Now that may be because you know the charges are not generally set at you know penally high rates. Again, if you, if you were charging somebody a hundred quid, it might do, but generally we don't. So it's availability first. And the issue of suppressed demand, again, is, is important when we're considering this issue. Charging can help to manage parking problems in particular areas. So um, a, a, a lot of sort of vehicle movements within cities are, are actually connected to people cruising around looking for a parking space. And the evidence shows that those problems are worse where there is a combination of free parking and excess demand. So if you get to a situation where there are more people wanting to park than there is space, then you know charging of some form is a no-brainer, really. You need to, to manage. And to be fair, most, most cities are in already doing that to, to some extent. Um, the, the amounts, um, you know, to, how much to charge, well often, you know, the amounts are, are set in order to, you know, to cover costs and may, maybe to raise some revenue rather than any sort of consideration of, uh, you know, what should the amounts be in order to manage the demand. The um, evidence on the uh, Nottingham workplace parking levy is interesting. Actually, one point just to clarify, the legislation at the moment does not allow uh, authorities to charge for spaces, you know, retail uh, customers, for example. That was mooted a few years ago, but, but is, is not possible. So it can only apply to um, workplace parking. Now, the consequences of the Nottingham were um, th th there was actually a fairly substantial impact on uh, businesses in that the number of uh, available parking 
spaces for staff within Nottingham did go down quite substantially from about 33,000 to 25,000. So that was one of the aims. You know, one of the aims was to um, literally just to reduce the availability of the, the parking within that area in order to achieve change. But you then come back to this same issue again is where there is suppressed demand. You, you take away, you remove uh, one type of journey and you leave the same amount of road space which means that other people can take that place and that is uh, more or less what happened in, in Nottingham uh, and there have been a number of studies that showed some change of behaviour amongst people driving to work um, but congestion actually went up in Nottingham after it was introduced. Um, it, it did have to be fair, it, it went up in other cities as well and some people, you know, there's some evidence to claim well it might have been worse but uh, put it this way, if you wanted to set about solving congestion I, I don't think you would you would do it like that. So you come back to the issue of why are you, why might you consider that this, um, it's more from a, a management and a revenue raising point of view. It did help or it is still helping to raise consistent amount of revenue which you know help Nottingham to expand their tram network and, and will continue to be available for other transport projects in the future. Thanks Steve. Julian I think we shortchanged you last time so I wondered whether you wanted to make any other quick responses. Well just, just I want to make a general point I suppose really which is about businesses and the extent to which they have a responsibility to try and mitigate the congestion that they're effectively responsible for in many ways in getting their um, employees <coughs> to work but also there's a big consideration with, with um, car use to work in that a lot of um, employees have pressure to Use their, take their car to work, use their car for in-business trips. And this is happening more and more, apparently, that what we call the grey fleet. Um, and, you know, people having to use their own cars to actually just get their work done. Um, and when you do try and put pressure on, on workplaces to do something about this, which is maybe by implementing something like this, or trying to not not granting expansion of car parks and this kind of thing, then businesses have to get on with it and do something a bit more creative. And there are creative solutions. So there are things like um, whoops, businesses, um, instead of expecting their employees to use their, their own cars, that they, they um, have pool cars uh, for, for employees to use, um, that they get together with bus companies and start to um, uh, subsidise some, some additional buses or bus routes and this kind of thing. They try and encourage um, car sharing among, among employees. So all I'm saying is that whilst the, the charge in itself has perhaps not worked brilliantly in, in Nottingham, say. Um, the, the, the charge can be, A, it can generate revenue, but it can be and it instigate these other more creative solutions for larger, larger, we're really talking about larger companies here. Okay. David Richard, have you got anything burning that you want to say or were you happy to pass it over to the table? Okay. All right, well, so um, back to your tables. You know the format. P workplace parking, levy, and increased parking charges, and then cookies. <laughs> I'll let you know. I'll give you your 20 minutes, okay? There's a fascinating bit of information, Isabel. <laughs> oh, there's, there's lots, right? But yeah. We're, yeah. Um, so a question about bus franchising and the um, kind of powers. So, uh, okay, excellent. It is a fascinating question. Um, so so uh, up until quite recently, most places in the UK have uh, kind of didn't have any powers to kind of uh, to bus franchise so it's a kind of deregulated environment so commercial operators decide what services they provide and then councils could put out contracts to subsidize particular routes so 
a kind of stagecoach might decide we're going to run buses from here to here and here to here, but we're not going to run them from there to there. And the council could say, well, we think it's important that there are buses from there to there, so we're going to run a contract for for that route. So what franchising um, enables places to do is to say, actually, we're going to... Uh, we're going to set the routes, we're going to set the timetables, we're going to set the pricing for kind of bus, buses across the whole area. Um, but only some uh, authorities have the powers to do that. So the combined authority for Cambridgeshire and Peterborough and the mayor of Cambridgeshire and Peterborough has the power to do bus franchising. And he has said that he will look at it and has kind of started a process to evaluate whether that is the right thing to do. Um, so he, he is looking at it. Yeah. At the moment, it's not. At the moment, it's a deregulated environment. So, so yeah, so they, they run a commercial service. Yeah. <laughs> yes, so when the combined authority was formed, the mayor got the, mayor got the power to do this. I think because Pete, so Peter's kind of said before that. What was the question? I say, so the, the, quest, the question was about, uh, about kind of stagecoach and, and their role. Um, and I think that as, so Peter's kind of outlined before, you ca so we've, we have talked, we talked a lot about the buses um, and there are ways that we can improve the buses without kind of a franchised environment. It is easier in a franchised environment because uh, there would be kind of, Con local control of the routes and the timetables and the pricing but if there is a commercial environment then having kind of funding that you can put into bus services can can that can still happen and you can still make improvements you just do it kind of through contracts or through partnerships so it's a it's a slightly different model okay i know there might be more questions and 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 we can call on on people but what i wanted to do now so you've looked at some of the core measures um and, and, and Lynn will do a bit of a recap, but now we're turning our attention more to sort of systems and supporting measures, of which there are, there are many, and so your, panel se your table session will be slightly different. But first off, Lynn, do you want to kind of recap on these and talk about what they are? I really do, yes. <laughs> so we spent... Uh, a lot of last weekend talking about where we want to get to and how much we would like better public transport, more and safer facilities for cycling and walking, uh, less time spent sitting in traffic jams, and there's that list of priorities. And then up until now today, we've been talking about what we believe to be the key... I'm going to put this down. Um, sort of ways you get there by doing one, two, or three of the following taking traffic off the road to make space for bus lanes or cycle lanes or better pedestrian facilities, or getting money to support better services in some way or to support the sort of construction of some of those things, and getting emissions down and carbon emissions down. So those are sort of three things that we've sort of been looking at so far. And all of the things we just talked about there sort of have the potential to make a decent chunk in those things, like a sort of big step change type contribution. Uh, and, and sort of broadly they're in three buckets then, so you can just stop people using the road. You can take the space from the vehicles and you can give it to the buses and the cycles and what have you, and, and you can just do that. Or you can try and persuade people to sort of make the space by charging them, and you can either charge them for driving or you can charge them for parking broadly speaking. Those are your sort of set of options and you can put them together in different ways. And the way you put them together in different ways will depend collectively on how ambitious you are, how much you care about making that change and how far you want to go towards it, how much money you might want to have to spend to invest. Um, and on your relative priorities, are you more concerned about congestion or about uh, emissions or what have you? And what do you really want to tackle or do you want to tackle them all? 
So there's all these different uh, ingredients in the recipe and a sort of decision about which recipe you want to bake in the first place. That's all going together. The next session is talking about measures which we've, we've struggled about what to call broadly things which might add on to these or supplement them or support longer term systems change, but which on balance we don't think of themselves are going to make a big step change in anything in the near future. But one of the ways it's maybe helpful to think of them is maybe they're almost like sort of boosters, like superchargers, right? So we're going to come to talk through them. If you put these on top of some of those other measures, it might, you know, the impact might go even further. But if you only did these, they probably wouldn't make a big step change on their own. And we've got a handful that we're going to talk through. You may also be able to think of others. Our expert panel may also want to throw some others in. So you could almost talk forever about all the things you could do. And we needed to conscribe, you know, circumscribe that because you're probably bored to death of talking about it at this point. So we're just going to go through a few quickly. If I can get other grabber. Oh. Right. So I'm not going to go through them all in detail uh, in, in the way that we did before. I'm just going to talk quite broadly. Number one, there's some stuff you can do with traffic signals. So you can fiddle with the traffic signals for one of two reasons. You can either just sort of fine tune them so they let the traffic flow better. And you can and there are definitely some sort of points in the network where there are problems and you can just resolve them with a bit of tweaking there. And that can have a big impact in those small localized areas, particularly where there's long queues building up. Um, you can sort of reduce emissions from standing traffic and you can make everything run more smoothly or you can make choices to let certain modes have priority. So you can have signals where if a bus turns up, it gets to go first. But if you don't layer that on top of a bus lane that lets the bus jump the queue to the front where the signals are, it doesn't really have much of an impact. And if you decide to use your signals to prioritize some modes over others, but you haven't fundamentally reduced the number of cars on the road, it's just going to make those cars queue for longer. It's not going sort of, to kickstart a change in the system. But if you were to put that on top of a bus lane, say, so if you had a bus lane and then at the end of it, the bus never had to stop anywhere on its journey because it was always prioritised, it could sort of supercharge the impact. Car sharing is another one where, in principle, if everyone didn't drive to work on their own in a car and four people sat in a car together, you could quarter the amount of traffic on the road. But we don't see anywhere where that's really happening. People have been trying to get car sharing happening for ages, and for whatever reason, people aren't awfully keen on it. Uh, so again, if you, you might have a system where you made space for bus lanes and things and you also allowed car sharers in them because that seems fair, but on its own, we think car sharing without some of that sort of other big enabling mechanism isn't going to do much. Same for travel planning. So travel planning is the idea that there are some institutions and employers which are much better placed than the council to know where people are coming from. So if you're, uh, you know, if you're a big employer with several hundred employees, you know where they live, you broadly know where they're coming from, you might be able to help them plan routes in that are sustainable. You might even be able to, say, fund a shuttle bus from the station or something. Um, but there aren't very many big employers who are big enough that they're going to be funding new bits of transport. Uh, so they're probably, that's probably going to be, again, it's sort of it's incremental change. It's not making a massive step change. You could really spend quite a lot of money rolling, or, or a little bit of money, or a lot of money, rolling out electric car charging points. That might really help catalyse the move from dirty cars to clean cars. Um, and if you, for example, had some charging either for parking or for driving that was dependent on, on having a dirty car or a clean car, you might speed the rate at which people change if you provide this infrastructure. But on its own, that might, that might help with emissions, it might help people move to a cleaner car, it's not going to make a step change in congestion, because people are still driving. And we've sort of thrown this in there just because we didn't want to not say it. There are other ways to raise revenue than to charge drivers for driving or parking. You can play around with council tax and, and business rates, but they're quite limited. So council tax, for one thing, the general part has huge calls on it. So council, there's just no money in local councils at the moment. So the chance of getting some of that money into transport is, is very difficult and very politically challenging. And there's all sorts of good calls on that money. The other thing is that local councils have quite limited ability to change what they get from those. Um, so that's a sort of risky source of revenue. If you decide that's the only source that you want to rely on, your chance of being able to really sure that it gets spent on transport are much less than if you get the money from transport. Um, so I'm going to pause there and hand over to the panel. Yeah. There are many others. It's not by any means an exhaustive lift, but we just wanted to flag them.
Great, thanks, Lynn. So we wanted to just, yeah, kick-start that. Um, panel, do you want to come up? And um, uh, David, I think you were just going to say a couple of points, and Gillian, you had um, a couple of points, and then I will tell you the slightly different task we're going to do in at groups. OK, a couple of quick comments. Um, electric charging points, a lot to be said for that, because the solution to urban air quality is electrification of vehicles, and you will also decarbonize the, ro the road transport system through that route. So promoting the uptake of electric vehicles is worthwhile uh, for people who don't have off-the-road parking at home where they can charge a car overnight. Having on-street charging points uh, will be a big help. Um, this is a kind of self-contained activity which could be funded uh, out of the... Um, city deal funding and would generate revenue from sales of electricity. So I think it's, it's kind of quite simple. How much you spend depends how ambitious you are, but it's uh, a sensible item of a program addressed specifically at air quality. Second, car sharing. We're of course used to share car, in, car sharing with friends and family and work colleagues. What's now becoming possible uh, and in practice ta is taking place is sharing with people who you don't know through apps um, which collect together people making a similar journey. Uh, for example, the Uber pool, where you can get a discount off the regular price of an Uber cab if you're willing to share. Uh, now, that's uh, a means of improving the efficiency of road transport by increasing vehicle occupancy. Um, but in my view, won't have much impact on congestion because of the story we've been hearing about suppressed trips, trips that have been yeah. suppressed because of the delays. If any measure you take that reduces congestion, releases these suppressed trips. <clears throat> so sharing, OK, in terms of uh, efficiency, but probably not a big uh, contribution to congestion relief. Thanks. Gillian. Okay, thanks. Well, with, with that caveat that really anything, uh, almost anything that we're talking about, if you take road space away, uh, then it's going to fill up again. So, so you maybe want to balance that. Um, just a couple of things. I really want to mention electric bikes. I, I absolutely agree we need electrification across the transport system, but electric cars are going to take quite a long time to filter through in a really meaningful way. They have to happen. We have to have supporting measures. But electric bikes, actually, I think, could have a bit a quicker impact and be quite a step change. So I'll just give you an example, the Netherlands. We think of the Netherlands as this mecca place where everybody cycles and they do, but almost 50% almost of trips um, in certain areas of the Netherlands are undertaken by bicycle. What's actually happening though is that even more cycling is being squeezed out of people in, into people's lifestyles through electric bikes because they expand the distance that can be travelled and they expand the sort of people that can use them. They, they enable some less fit or uh, etc. people to be able to use them. So they could be really important. In this country, we are slow on the uptake uh, compared to many other countries with them. They can be quite expensive, but where they're going in as shared bike schemes in this country so far, they're happening in the centre of cities, which is not where they are optimally going to be used. They need to be put out further away, and then they could really potentially um, be used where, where car trips are used. So that's one thing, electric bikes. The other thing is about sharing. So we've talked about trip sharing. Uh, but car, share, car sharing or car clubs, actually, is what we call them in this country. Uh, again, it's something that we have actually quite a few of scattered around. I think you have them in Cambridge, Zipcar, etc. Um, what, what we're actually talking about here, and, and I really want to make this point, is that when we talk about alternatives to the car, we're not necessarily talking about people giving up their car. We, in, in many cases, many of these solutions can mean that households with two cars can go down to one car, say, um, which means that their second car, which once they get it, they use it for everything, is just not used as much. So these are sort of solutions which just edge the way to being able to use cars less, but not necessarily getting rid of the car. We're never going to do that. So something like car clubs, where people have a pay-as-you-go access to cars, um, to enable a much more flexible approach to owning, perhaps not owning one at all, but certainly maybe owning less in the household, are really, really important. It's sort of a glue that can stick some of these other interventions together and enable people to still um, use, use, use cars when they need to. 
Great. Steve, Richard, did you want to add anything uh, quickly? A couple of things. The, on the electrification, I agree with what David said. Also points out, um, Cambridge City Council has declared a climate emergency. Now, if they are actually serious about that, um, obviously electrification, I mean, electric cars, as discussion on some of the tables have had, they're not a panacea. They're not going to solve all our problems. But... Um, they do have, they will be a very big part over the next few years in um, decarbonising transport and improving urban pollution. A lot of this will have to come at a national or international level, but there's an awful lot that could be done locally to accelerate that process. So you might want to think about that. Um, car clubs, we did some research uh, a few years ago working with. Uh, property developers and so on, um, and th there is a big role for car club clubs in uh, car-free, so-called car-free developments or, or developments in places where the, the parking is reduced, where there just physically isn't uh, the space for everybody to, to have a parking space. Uh, space. So I think it's more, it's not so much that the car clubs will change travel behaviour in themselves, it's a supporting measure where if you're building at high density and you're not providing parking for everyone to have a car, then it enables normal life to continue more, more easily. Yeah, and lastly, uh, travel planning, um, it's not a particularly glamorous uh, part of the, of, the, of the toolbox, but um, it can have some important results yeah, locally. So I've, I've known examples that I've worked on where we've made businesses take more responsibility for the travel impacts they have on, on the network. And just simple things like getting 10 companies that are co-located co to procure their, their milk, uh, and procure their litter collection. So you don't get 10 deliveries of milk, you get one delivery you get uh, one, uh, one uh, waste collection rather than 10 vehicles turning up. And th these are all things that can be done very simply, um, but they, they require sort of to, to, to wear, um, wear out your shoe leather because you're, you're, you've got to build a relationship with the businesses rather than um, just sort of building a bit of kit and then walking away. Great. Thank you. So I think as Lynn suggested, actually there are... You know, this is a, oh, the slide that was up there, that was a, that, that's a starting list, okay? But there are other measures. And in fact, last, um, at the pr at weekend one, some of you remember we had the solutions basket and when we were looking at some of the comments, other people had suggested some solutions. So uh, your table facilitators have got those up on post-it notes. So in this session, we want you to just take a slightly different tack in terms of, looking at those measures that Gillian, that Lynn, that others have suggested and going, okay, you know, how far do we think these might be viable? And then importantly, I also want you to go, and what else would I expect to be some of the supporting and behavioral measures? And we've got the starting list from some of the ones that you suggested in weekend one. But are there other things that you would expect to be part of that mix? So if there are things that you additionally want to generate, then tomorrow we will look at, we'll, we're going to do another Mentimeter vote on those measures in particular and say, these are the ones that I really think are going to have an impact in Cambridge that I want to see sort of moved forward. So that's just for these sort of supporting and systems measures, which, as Lynn said, are un maybe unlikely to kind of make this significant step change, but are important nonetheless in providing the glue that hangs this all together. Okay, so we're going to have some work at tables and then we're going to rapidly get some, or get some table feedback on those as well because it's important, I think, that you hear what the key messages are from your tables because we will combine those together when we come back to them next week. Yeah, quick question over here. So of the 500 million city deal? So of the 500 million city deal, what has not been allocated? Isabel, can you uh, run in a kind of Annika Rice way <laughs> through the tables? <laughs> She's nearly here. So, so it's a, a kind of a 15-year programme, um, and the £500 million pounds is uh, kind of meant to be over those years, match-funded by kind of local contributions. So that's uh, basically the 
three authorities putting in some of the other money that they have through things like Section 106 planning agreements and new homes bonus, which is another kind of uh, source of income into the pot uh, for the city deal as well. So um, we, so some of our kind of things are are kind of well underway and allocated, and some are more in kind of terms of saying, okay, in the future we'll spend this this much money. So we've got about 650 million pounds worth of of plans um, against definitely 500 million pounds of uh, government money subject to passing the kind of reviews that we have to pass, plus uh, kind of the local funding, some of which has already been found, others of which will be found kind of over the next period of time. So uh, that does include a kind of a portion, um, and I'm going to try and remember exactly how much it is. It's about kind of 75 million that's there for kind of forward funding uh, public transport service improvements, so some of the things in your booklet like uh, kind of making the bus more affordable, making it kind of uh, more frequent, um, and that, but that's just a kind of a broad allocation and that comes back to the kind of uh, question that you have about how, how big is your vision and how far do you want to go with things and it also comes back to the uh, kind of point that's been made that if you were going to uh, kind of do any of these these measures that uh, kind of impact on people's use of the car, you'd want to put the public in transport and the walking and cycling and alternatives in place first. Um, so, you, so with the city deal, we have the opportunity to do that, to put some of these things in first and then uh, kind of to look at how the measures would work. Um, so so there's kind of, there is a bit of funding kind of around for that, although the exact, what it will exactly be spent on hasn't been decided. Okay. So as before, you have the experts to draw on at your tables as you come up with kind of points and clarifications. <laughs>